The third kind of technological constraint we're going to talk about has to do with ecology. And this has to do with, uh, you know, sort of the, basically the distribution of natural resources and also our ability to sustain life, uh, you know, human life and otherwise inside the system that we uh, um, place our innovation in. And so again, we're going to put our innovation in some context. And so what is the effect of that context on our innovation from an ecological perspective and the effect of our innovation on that uh, ecosystem as well? We're talking about three kinds of constraints or sub-constraints within here. Uh, first being the availability of necessary inputs. Where do we get the inputs that we allow to that may help us make the transformations we need to? Where do we make those transformations? So I'm talking about a site, the suitable site for transformation. And then also, when our system has outputs, when our innovation creates outputs, where do those outputs go? And some of the outputs are the ones that we want as outputs, the, you know, the, the, um, the outputs, we would call them. But then there's some other things called the byproducts and what happens with those. So let's start with necessary resources. If you're going to do um, certain activities that you would do require a great deal of power, for example. And so in the case of the A-12 aircraft, what they needed was they needed lots of power to be able to test these engines. And so they needed to put the testing facility, the innovation, you know, basically the place where they're doing the innovation, in some place where electricity was available. And in fact, they had to do the testing at night because the city used too much power during the day. And so if they did these tests at night, they could actually get enough power out of the power grid. Interestingly, um, you might say, well, we can put the system where it's best for the system. Think of solar power. So in solar power, actually, you know, just off the top of your head, you might think that solar power, the best place for solar power might actually be in the desert, right? Because there's lots of sun, there's no clouds, a lot of rain. This should be a great place for it. Well, it turns out all the ways that we know how to use or how to produce power through solar energy require a great deal of cooling. So the paradox is you have this place where there's lots of sun, but there's not a lot of water available. And so how do you mitigate that? How do you make that work? You know, there may be other materials that we need as well. Another thing, we was talking about, about power, um, nuclear power plants, for example. In nuclear power plants, they have to be sited at places where there's, uh, you know, they're immune to weather. Uh, we may have humidity issues. You have um, ground stability and, you know, are there earthquakes in that area? What's the temperature uh, there? Nuclear power plants also require a great deal of uh, cooling. And so when you put one next to a river and you pull the water out and you, you basically you cool down your reactor, you put it back into the river, the water's at a much higher temperature. And this also creates a problem in terms of siting effort for um, transformation. So if it's a very small river, you may raise the temperature of that thing too high in order to sustain life within it. And that began, becomes the kind of problem that you have to face. We may also have the siting, that is we may put our transformation Information, put our innovation inside of a biological host. And so if we're putting something inside of a person, you know, we're putting something inside of a cow, that those kind of things, those constraints of biology also may constrain us as well. It's like, how do I get them inside? How do I keep that thing alive while I actually have these things in there? So again, doing the, you know, as I used an example uh, a long while ago, keeping the body alive during brain surgery is a very difficult thing, that we have to be able to sustain life and do it within the limitations of our understanding. And so again, this is about, not about conscious competence, but it's really within the limits of our understanding. Then we have this problem of raw input availability. And the raw inputs that I need to bring into my innovation in order to do the transformation, they might not be available in the place I need. And so again, like power and all these things, how do I get the access to the, the material, the inputs that I need to make my innovation possible? Then we have the problem of outputs. Outputs, you know, basically we're transforming inputs into outputs, and that's happening at some site, um, and there are constraints there. The constraints are the, uh, in the products that we produce, you know, the good stuff, but also the unhealthy uh, bad stuff that we produce as well. There's an example of Xintang, uh, and that's my bad ch Chinese pronunciation, Xintang, China, um, where there's a city known as Jean City or Cowboy City, uh, where they produce a lot of, of denim material for use in, in the Western market. And so go ahead and watch this video, and you'll see one of the problems where we actually have taken something that might have made sense at the beginning, where we might have had one factory or two factories or three factories, and amplified it to where we have 1,500 factories in one small area, the kind of problems uh, that we create from that. This also underlies the problem of our um, willingness to put the manufacturing, that is the transformation of products, in other places and concentrate in places and not account for the cost that that creates on the ecology in those areas because we're in a safe and, and different area ourselves. And so we want to consume blue genes and this is the kind of problems that we create by doing that. 